One of the joys of standing in the pulpit is I get to listen to you. You sound great. You know that? You are good singers. Keep it up. It's a sign of a healthy congregation. It is indeed. When we lift our voices together, a professor I had in seminary said, when we sing, we sound the truth of who we are. Think about that. And you all sound beautiful. So I bring you greetings from the 154 other churches of the main conference of the United Church of Christ, from the pastors and people, from also from our national church, our three collegium members, our general minister and president, John Dorhauer, and the 37 other conference ministers uh, out across the United States who lead various conferences. I bring you greetings from the Winthrop Congregational Church and the Reverend Chrissy Cataldo. That's the church I belong to. All of us in the United Church of Christ are grounded in our local church. No matter what our role is, no matter what we're doing, clergy who are not serving a local church still are required to belong to a church. So I am grateful for that congregation, especially because they put up with me not being there very often. And they welcome me into their choir, though, when I, when I, can, um, when I can be there. So I thought I should explain what the conference is and maybe even what a conference minister is because I find that most people don't know. A conference is a gathering of churches, historic. In um, our case, it's the churches of the United Church of Christ in Maine. We've been around since the early 1800s with different names, and now we're part of the United Church of Christ. Across the U.S., there are some conferences that contain several states because there aren't too many churches, so there's a lot of geography with a few churches. You will be surprised to know that my colleagues, conference minister colleagues, will sometimes look at me and say, oh, so you're from one of the small conferences because we don't look very large geographically to some of these places, even though we feel so big. Conference minister. I hesitate, but I always use this language. If we had bishops, I would be a bishop. I'm not. I don't have that kind of authority to um, enforce things, to tell anyone what to do. As you know, in the UCC, no one tells you what to do. Right? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But as one of my colleagues recently says, it's a great thing, and I like it too, because no one tells me what to do either. It's great. <laughs> It's awesome. We have, though, autonomy in covenant. I recently heard it expressed that way, and I love it. We have our autonomy. No one tells me what to do in covenant. And it's my joy to be the person here in Maine who um, tries to help our covenant be alive and well, to help us be joined together in ministry because we've chosen to be. We have all chosen, each of our churches has voted along the way to be connected. And that means, and it's not a great, it's not a perfect analogy, but as in a marriage or in a very close friendship, we voluntarily join together and we work for each other's health and well-being and growth and thriving because we've decided to do that out of our free will. And it binds us together then in commitments and um, in mutual covenant. So I provide leadership in that way, leadership into this very changing new world we're in. I don't think that I have to really tell you that. Um, in the conference, we help churches find pastors, as we fairly recently did with you and Brian. Um, that's some work that I do too, some of the churches that I do that for. And we have Darren Morgan, who's our associate conference minister, who also does that work. Um, I am with your churches and with pastors in times of joy and trouble. Part of what I am is pastor to the pastors. So sometimes pastors need a pastor too. And they find it in colleagues and sometimes in me or in Darren. 
I'm responsible for relationships with the churches, for consulting about vitality. I'm the CEO of the nonprofit organization that is the main conference. We have staff, we have finances. I'm responsible for the, that administrative um, aspect. In the conference, we have four main priorities. We are focused on developing and nurturing leaders in our conference, lay leaders, cler clergy leaders, including the wonderful work we do at Pilgrim Lodge. I'm hoping you're sending some kids or trying to find some kids to go or going yourselves. There's a grandparents camp that's awesome, I'm told. I think at least one of the sessions is full, but you could try. We support our churches, number two, in being stronger and more vital and figuring out how to be lively, spirit-filled places that attract folks and help people find God. Lively, spirit-filled places that don't require that people come here to be part of the organization, that allow for church out there and for an outward focus, which is one of the key signs to a vital church. We are living out our oneness in Christ between our local churches of the, your association, the conference, and also ecumenically with other Christian churches in an interfaith way with people of other faiths, and even by joining with um, partners who are secular but who have values that are like ours or that go with ours. And in all of this, this is number four, we are working for justice and peace and the care of God's creation. So we don't have much to do. Not so much. I sit around twiddling my thumbs, just as you do, right? Um, I came to this ministry all, coming up on two years ago. Um, I was 10 years as a local church pastor in Connecticut, in Bloomfield, Connecticut, in a multicultural, multiracial congregation. I had practiced law for 15 years before that, and I had a brief career as a music teacher. So I tell the choir always that if I'm not preaching, my place is with them. I am so thrilled to be here. I've been vacationing in Maine since I was a small child, and I have a lot quite significant family roots um, down east, and there was a family farm in Madison for many years, so um, it feels like coming home, and I'm grateful to be with you. So the main message I bring, if I don't bring anything else, is this. You are not alone. In all of what you do, in griefs, in joys, in struggles, in figuring out how to be the church, you are not alone. You have 154 other churches. You have staff in the conference. You have uh, about 5,000 churches across the U.S., all of whom are your sisters and brothers in faith in covenant. We are moving forward together. We've been restructuring in the conference. We've been doing some of probably what you're doing too, um, getting more nimble, all of those things we're doing in, this, in these times. And we're trying more and more to live out our covenant. Um, one way to think about covenant is it's a container for the messiness of being church. If, you're if everything's sort of nice and simple and easy and everyone always gets along and everything, you're probably not doing it right. Church by its nature, good church, is messy. And the covenant gives us a way of when there's difference of opinion, we still hang in there. It gives us something to contain all of what we're doing together. I need to take a minute always in this to thank, thank you for your generosity, the contributions that you have made to the conference and to the wider church. I hope you hear me with this. There are ministries that happen, mission that takes place because of you that would not happen but for the generosity of this congregation. And I am grateful that that is one aspect of the covenant that you have been living out. And I know it's something you've been talking about, and I'm very grateful for the conversations you all have been having about how you continue to support this covenantal relationship even more strongly. So here's the thing. I don't know. Maybe Brian's told you about this. But did you know we're having a 500-year rummage sale Maybe not. No. 
not in those terms. Maybe he's talked. So there are some historians who look back over the, the arc of church and religious history in the Western world, and they've noticed that about every 500 years, not only in the church world, but in society, there seems to be a huge upheaval, a time of great change when the paradigm shifts. So if you went back before Jesus, if you read your Bible, you would notice about 500 years before was the first fall of the temple in Jerusalem. It was the first time that Judaism was made uh, portable, the covenant, instead of being all the way, only based in that physical location in Jerusalem, um, went out with the people in diaspora after they were displaced by the Babylonian um, conquerors. And we come to Jesus, and our scripture today is a perfect example of the disciples of the people of the time trying to deal with, cope, make sense of the changes that were happening in the society and as a result of Jesus being born and living and dying and being resurrected in our world. Everything changed because of Jesus. So then about 500 years later, there was something called the Council of Chalcedon. They were making some decisions about theology and about the way the church would be together. At about 1000 AD was the Great Schism, the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church and the um, Eastern Orthodox Church broke off from one another, which was a, an important moment in church history. 500 years ago, you know what happened. Some of you do. What was the big thing in church history 500 years ago? The Reformation, and we are actually celebrating 500 years this year. Um, Martin Luther supposedly nailed 95 theses to a cathedral door, things he was objecting to in the Catholic Church. There was a technology that drove the Reformation and drove changes at that time. What was the technology? <coughs> the printing press, without it, those 95 theses would have sat there and waited for some monk to transcribe them in, in beautiful calligraphy so that the very few people who could read could read them. With the printing press, they were reproduced. Uh, literacy increased by leaps and bounds. People could read the Bible for themselves. It was a huge shift in creating Protestantism and creating another way for people to engage their faith. But here we are now, and you all know what the technology is, right? What's driving our changing world now? The internet. I look around this room, maybe not all, but just about all of us can remember when there was no internet, right? Think about it. In my lifetime, surely, the, 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 the level and degree of change in just the way we live our lives is unbelievable. If you think about it, if we could have thought about it when we were children, it was the stuff of science fiction and it's all come true. And here we are trying to be the church in hundreds of year old buildings with liturgies that go back hundreds of years with, you know, then, and with realistically folks less and less wanting to join things, not only the church, but the Kiwanis and the Rotary and the Grange and all, you know. So we're stuck in this. We listened well to our scripture today there's a moment in the middle of the passage where they've been walking along and this stranger comes along and starts walking with them and he says he doesn't know what's going on. They said, how could you not know what was going on? And, and, they, and he's asking and they said, but we had hoped that he was the Messiah. We had hoped that everything was fixed, that everything would be right, that the Messiah had come, that we were all set. We had hoped that everything would be just fine. And our hopes have di are dashed. And we don't know what to do. And they were so preoccupied with talking over and over and over about all the changes and what had happened and what, what about this and what that, that they couldn't recognized Jesus. They were so caught up in thinking about what their hopes 
had been that they couldn't see the next thing, the Jesus resurrected, walking next to them, always walking beside them. I, if you look at the scripture through the lens of this rummage sale thing, this is a pivot point. This is a moment of turning from that old idea, those hopes, toward where we go next. These people on the journey, so confused, grief-stricken, so hard to let go, so hard to let go, and there was Jesus, walking with them even though they couldn't see him, explaining again, how many times in the Gospels do you hear Jesus explaining to anyone who will listen, really, this is what I'm talking about. The Messiah is coming. I'm going to die. I'm going to be resurrected. And they couldn't hear. And he's still explaining. Thank God, Jesus. And he's willing to keep explaining. And still, to this day, we can keep that the world is transformed. And that Jesus never leaves us. Never. And doesn't give up doesn't give up. The thing they didn't do, those, those people, those disciples walking along, was they were so preoccupied with going over and over and over with what had happened that they couldn't pay attention to what God was doing right next to them. It's that how do we help ourselves in the midst of what is extremely challenging, it feels to me like the pace of change now just keeps accelerating. I don't know about you. It's true in my life. How do we pay attention so that we see Jesus in one another, in the events of the world, in little moments when God shows up? It's that paying attention that is so hard I'm, um, and I tell you, it's hard. I've started last week an eight-week course in mindfulness training. John Kabat-Zinn created this process um, because I find that I get so, I'm pulled in so many directions and there are so many stressors and there's just so much to think about and be concerned with and I, I need to relearn to be, as a colleague once said to me, need to relearn where to be, how to be where my feet are. I said, I asked her, well, how are you? She says, I'm trying to learn how to be where my feet are. And maybe these people on the road, if they could have been where they were, might have seen, really seen, Jesus. There's another gift in this scripture. There are many gifts, but another one and I'm grateful to um, a commentator, David Lose, for this idea. That there is, in some ways, a, a movement in this narrative that is worship. First, the two travelers meet on the road. They gather. They're together. And the scriptures are open to them. And then they share a meal that reveals Christ's identity. And then they are sent out to share that information, to share the wonder of what they've learned. It is worship. We gather together. We have our scripture. We share communion, and we go out. If we will do that faithfully, and not just here in this space, it helps us stay where we are. It helps us stay grounded in God, grounded in the Spirit, So I have to say for me that one of the key, probably the key lesson I'm learning is to remember my basics in these times, to remember to worship, remember to stop and pray, remember to read the Bible, to not be distracted by going over and over and over and over, whatever is happening, for God is with us. God is with us. 
God is doing a new thing. Church as we know it is slowly going away. It took the early church several hundred years to really become church. It takes time. God is offering us something. God has showed up. He's saying, here, here's what to do next. It's really true. I see it all over Maine. There are churches like this one, thriving, growing. People really need a place to be together with God and one another. So friends, I'm going to tell you one last little story. I was along um, the Mass Turnpike. I still have friends and family in Massachusetts and Connecticut, and I was on the Mass Turnpike at the um, Charlton rest stop a few months ago. And I got my coffee from the McDonald's, and I walked out in the middle. There's a place where you can put the Splenda, and I got putting the Splenda in my coffee. And there were two gentlemen just here, standing there in the middle of all this bustling people coming and going. And every time someone went by, they, what they did was they sort of come up next to me and they said, Jesus loves you. Oh, Jesus loves you too. I said... And they went away and told the next person, Jesus loves you. Let's remember that. And let's, in unlikely places, tell people. Let's tell each other. Let's walk together, not just in this church, but in the main conference, in the national UCC, because that is the message. That is the message. We are joined together and united in Christ's love. And God is always with us. May we move forward together. May we walk together with Jesus into whatever's coming. Thanks be to God. Amen.